Somebody once said that education is like the structure on which you hang the rest of your life. Well, if that be true, uh, I would think of it as a kind of wall in a gallery. It's sort of flat, um, it's monotonous, it's got a top and a bottom and two sides. Using that analogy in an art gallery, it really only is interesting when you begin to paint pictures which you hang on it. So it's the painting of pictures that we put on all of this that really matters. Mm -hmm. And this particular art gallery was Chum in County Galway, where, where, you, where you grew up. That was I mean, the art gallery of my uh, childhood. Uh, was it a very different town in any way, or was it your, your typical Irish um, provincial town of the 1930s, 40s? I suppose it was typical in a number of ways, but it had the added advantage that there was the input from the sugar factory in Tume, so there was a sense of an emerging technology, as it would have been at the time. It was also at a stage when the outer parts of the town still didn't have electricity, so I was able to see at first hand the transformations which a new technology can make, both positive and negative, on the lives of people. And there were extraordinary people in the town. There was an extraordinary range of skills of all kinds. Uh, many people in the town were, in my view, sort of unselfconscious artists. The manner in which women could uh, metamorphize the wedding dress into a confirmation dress for the daughter at 12 or 13 and metamorphize it again into a Holy Communion dress for the daughter seemed to me an astonishing skill. The human body is an odd shape, and to have material which had already been made up as something else was an incredible sort of talent. And a skill, of course, that was born out of necessity because uh, they wouldn't have been able to afford, I suppose, the, the Confirmation dress or the Communion dress uh, at that time. Well, exactly that, and that also influenced my subsequent thinking because I now refer to technologies where you have a cascade use of the material. You use the same piece of material in different roads over a period of time. And I got those deep insights in Tume at a very early stage. Uh, there were blacksmiths in the town, John Connolly was one, who used to actually draw the gates in the ashes with the top of the poker. And he'd say to the farm, would you like a twirl on it here? He was talking about the metal turns on the gates. And as a result of all of those kind of skills, I was very conscious of the need to preserve and build on those and it advised a lot of the work I did subsequently on human-centered systems and a great area of interest of mine which is this tacit knowledge. Now, can you just explain what you mean by tacit knowledge? Well tacit knowledge was explained by the philosopher of science Pogliani who said there are things we know but cannot tell. It's a sense of shape, size, form and appropriateness we have which we acquire through practice, through relating to materials, to working with materials. And since it can't be written down or explicitly stated, there's a tendency with modern educational uh, systems to ignore it or to say it doesn't mm. exist, that the only important things are those things which we can state explicitly. And I saw vivid examples of that during my childhood. Uh, there was a stonecutter in the town who made a gravestone for our family and I remember him saying to me, if you come back next week, the head will be coming out of the stone as though it was being born from the stone. He was really like Michelangelo. He could already see the figure in the material and his, all he had to do was to remove all that which was not the figure. That was a tremendous example of tacit knowledge and insight. And yet these people were just treated as stonecutters. In fact, they were master craftsmen in the best historical sense of the word. I remember you telling me before also about the, was it the women who made the shawls uh, with, with uh, such uh, intricate design and craft that they, they, they would surpass anything that uh, you might get a, a degree for it. Well, that certainly <laughs> is Britain. true. I remember going to Galway and they still used to make the clad shawls and it was an astonishing piece of textile design in the best sense of the word and I have seen people get degrees in fine art at the Royal College of Art in London who in my view couldn't even begin to approach remotely those kind of skills but they can write about them so I became conscious very early on that our society values more linguistic ability rather than real intelligence and it's something I've tried to address throughout my lifetime. Another great skill at that time, probably sadly not as, uh, not as uh, evident nowadays, was that of, of storytelling. 
Yes, indeed. The storytelling had an enormous influence on me. It, it was the case that people used to gather in particular houses. I remember McDonough's on the Tunnadaly Road. And people would tell standardised, stylized stories, the great old classical stories from the west of Ireland. And usually people did so facing the fire. And I have still childhood images of these Rembrandt-like heads who would vividly portray a story. But as children, we tried to emulate that. And we used to have games where we would uh, try to tell a story that would make somebody laugh or try to s tell a story that would make somebody cry. I literally used to succeed on occasion in making the other kids cry with my very moving stories. But all of that conveyed to me that there was the real possibility of having a whole range of what I like to call magic carpets in one's mind. Uh, I became aware of that when I subsequently read about the Arabian Nights, that you could conjure up images of imaginary countries where people cared for nature or were kind to each other, or extraordinary machines which allowed human beings to do all kinds of things. So through that storytelling tradition, my imagination was greatly inflamed, and I still have this great reservoir of magic carpets on which I can fly wherever when, on occasion, I'm moved to do so. Right. And you mentioned reading about the Arabian Nights. I mean, was did you do much reading as a child, or were there, were books available to you, accessible to you? Books were quite available because my mother and father represented different aspects of my life. My father had the garage, practical things, took me out a lot in the countryside, and so on. My mother used to read a lot, and at a very early stage, uh, I became acquainted with the works of Walter Mackham, this sort of thing. She also used to read a lot of poetry. She composes odd pieces of poetry, and um, she's 90 now, and she's recently composed another poem about garden field in Tuam. So that was a very rich culture for me. Mm -hmm. you, know, you mentioned there about your father taking you out in the countryside. Of course, that was the, the great thing about not only were you living in a town, but you had the you had nature literally on your doorstep. And I think things like, you know, playing in the, in the local river or watching the flight of the, the geese. Were These were enormous influences on, on me. I was conscious very early on what a naturalist treasure trove I had all around me and I really relished that in a, in a childlike way of course I used to marvel when the skeins of geese would return in October, it was always the third week in October and I would wonder how they had guided themselves, whether they were using the Earth's magnetic lines or whether they guiding themselves by the stars and that subsequently inflamed my interest in guidance systems, control systems and so on uh, I used to spend the summer sometimes in Galway and uh, with my Uncle Martin in Galway looked down at the salmon where and I was fascinated by the fact that salmon could find their way back to the same river in the same part of the world having been thousands and thousands of miles away. These were astonishing features of nature which really did inflame my appetite and I still enjoy nature enormously and have tremendous respect for it mm. and feel part of it. Well, just before we, we, we move out of your childhood, of course, I suppose the, the great thing about childhood is, is, is the happiness and the fun of, of playing games. And you were no different than any other child. You, you played your hurling on the, on, the, on the roads or in the, in the fields and whatever. But you're, you're, you were learning a lot, at, even at that stage, from playing. Yes, I, I, I was, because I always remember that um, <clears throat> when we'd have these games in the town, each road would play against the others. And I think there were seven roads in the town and I was conscious very early on that how you defined a road often determined whether you stood a good chance of winning it by that I mean that if all your best players were in the road within the precincts of the town you would try to get an agreement early on that it was only the roads up to the edge of the town that counted mm. but we had a number of players who lived out the Milltown Road one of them lived in Milltown and they were excellent players so we wondered how we could somehow change the rules, as it were. So we decided that a road would be defined as the road through which you came to go to school, which meant we had a much bigger catchment area. Now, a year or two afterwards, if we found that others were using the catchment area, we might try and change the ground rules again. And a lot of the capacity to negotiate, I guess, to be political in one sense, or in the trade union work I, uh, when I was involved in negotiations, or even in complicated 
contracts which are now negotiated in an international sense, the capacity to try and set the ground rules in advance are very important. So even in, in childhood games, one can learn an enormous and amount. Politicians children in the Sorbonne. Yeah. Now, one of your, you, you have always had a great interest in, in language and in languages, and, and uh, th- there's a fascinating story of how you uh, acquired, rather, how you learned rather than were taught German. Yes, I always point out that I learned German rather than uh, studying it. I, I did like languages very much, Latin, I liked Irish very much, I liked the use of the English language, uh, and on the other side I liked engineering and science. But I remember at that time children used to go a lot to the cinema. We used to go on, I think it was a Sunday afternoon, which used to be called the Fourpenny Rush, as, mm. as I recollected. And there were still films of the war, and cuts of Hitler. And I was fascinated, firstly, by the resonance and dynamism of his speeches without having the slightest idea of what they were about. And I subsequently had a colleague on the Balagadi Road, and I used to go and listen to his um, records, which were the O78s, and he had a lot of Beethoven's music and Mozart and so on. And it really did jar with me how a nation that could have produced the beauty of Beethoven and Mozart could also produce the hideousness of Hitler. And I really felt I should try and find out something about that language and that culture. And when I was 14, I remember going down the high street in Chum, and a lorry had stopped to get petrol, I think, on the way to the sugar factory, and there was a machine on the back of the lorry, and it had this marvellous word, Schleifscheibe Durchmesser, about 28 letters. And I thought, God, this is a language that really does have words of glorious length and marvellous sound. And I simply decided I was going to learn German. And I went down to the Kaplan family. They were a Viennese family. He was the chief engineer in the sugar factory. And I announced to Mrs. Kaplan that I was going to come to learn German. This was at 14. By the time I was 18, when she got over her shock and agreed to accept this, um, I could really speak absolutely fluent German. And mm-hmm. I now present television programs in German, I write books in them and so on, but I have never studied German. Now that seems to me to say a lot about the educational process, that one needs the excitement, the motivation and so on, and then the capacity to draw on resources that are around one. And even in Tume, which was not a centre of Germanic studies, if one has the imagination to look for resources, you will find all these ways you can get of doing things. It causes one to be resourceful. Mm. When you moved on to a second level education, we, we've spoken about this before, but uh, I think I pointed out to you that you, 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 in a sense, pioneered comprehensive education because you started out with the Christian Brothers and then when you couldn't do there some of the, the more uh, practical subjects you wanted to do, you, you, you branched into the, the technical school. That's true. I was very, very keen to learn workshop technology and to have access to a lathe and that type of machine tool and also to learn technical drawing, which seems to me to be a marvellous subject. And that was not available in the Christian Mm. Brothers School. So I asked if I could have the Wednesday afternoon off. I'd already worked out that that's when it was going on in the tech. And the Christian Brothers were really horrified that anybody should want to go to the tech. And they wouldn't agree to it. And I then spoke to my parents about that. And they agreed that I could continue Latin and German and all these sort of things I was doing on my own and go to the tech full time. And when I told Brother Rafferty about that, I still remember the shock on his face. And he said, if you go to that place, he didn't even call it a school, if you go to that place, you will be finished, he said. Only the children from the Tabajalath Row go there. That was a kind of down market part of the town. And it showed me that often educationists and others do really try to protect you from what they regard as a dangerous or uncertain or unpredictable situation, when in fact it's precisely through that that we often gain the richest insights into things. So I formed my own comprehensive education. Right. And it was there in the tech that you met this, uh, this marvellous teacher of, of metalwork, was it? I Sean met this Thierry? extraordinary teacher. I mean, I'm sometimes very critical of formal education, but I must always highlight the marvellous exceptions, great gifted teachers I met, and he was one. He'd worked in England for Vickers and elsewhere, so he could give a vision of what engineering and metalwork 
could be like. He also had a deep sense of quality of workmanship and he would sometimes hold up a piece of material and say, isn't that beautiful? Just mm-hmm. surface finish. Now the culture that transmitted by doing that was very powerful. And I remember talking to him and I said I was very keen to design and build a steam engine and he was um, a good enough facilitator and teacher to say, well, all right, let's try and do it. And the only machine tool we had was a lathe and with him I designed and built a double acting steam engine, which I have to this day. And it was a a very, very formative experience because I was designing something in advance. I had to try and work out the velocities of the different parts and so on. But also from a resource procurement point of view, if I might put it like that, because we needed close grain cast iron for the cylinders and there was simply none in Turin. Now, if I was going to be a good civil servant, I'd have learned at that stage that you write a report about the material you want, you then write a report saying there's none available, and you conclude the project can't be done. But what we did was frantically look for material all around the place. And we heard that there was an old sawmill with a flywheel, and we knew that a flywheel has to stand high centrifugal forces, so it would have had good close grain cast iron. We went out and we cut a huge chunk of cast iron out of this old abandoned flywheel, divided up into pieces and made this marvellous steam engine, which I have and which works to this day. That whole, as you say, that, that, that approach to design and to th- that, that can-do mentality, rather than, you know, that it, 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 it can be done and therefore it will be done. And that's something that I suppose is, is lacking in the, more, in the more formal, normally in the more formal education system and in the, very often maybe in the industrial uh, system that we have. I think it is sadly lacking. I think the educational system prepares people to analyse rather than to do the great strength of a craft tradition and that articulated through a sensitive education system is that it encourages this sort of can-do mentality. And that for me was very much reinforced when I went into the sugar factory for about nine months, I think it was, before I went to Germany and Switzerland to study. And... There, the whole orientation with the craftspeople was a can-do mentality. During the sugar campaign, if a great machine broke down, and there were huge machines in the factory, the whole place was geared to getting that working again. And nobody had any doubt but that they could get it working. So it was this very positive feedback, not sort of if we can get it working, but how we'll get it working. And they would organise themselves into teams, they quickly think of all the things that could be done. They didn't spend hours and hours talking about the things that could not be done. And that, for me, was a tremendous sort of reinforcement of the positive can-do mentality rather than the can-analyse mentality. And in that factory, they had steam turbines, they had huge big diesel engines, they got an excellent machine shop. And the range of things I learned from those craftspeople who essentially were transmitting a culture. People often mistake an apprenticeship for something like the transmission of manual dexterity actually is the transmission of a great culture, how to organise yourself, how to get materials, how to plan things, the logistics of getting materials together. So Mm. that was a very valuable experience for me. And it was there I also met these extraordinary other apprentices. There was Michael Hussey, who has done all kinds of extraordinary things in the meantime. Tom Murphy was there in the factory at that time. Uh, a great singer, as I recollected, making up poems and plays sort of during working time. And Michael Brennan, who is now a trade union leader, who was a great orator. And the very first day I went into the factory, this will fix the time, I suppose, he came up and asked me, if, uh, as he said, would you give me a bob? Because he wanted to send a telegram to Castro to congratulate him arriving in uh, Cuba back into Cuba. Mm. So, I mean, it was both a political as well as a technical formative period for me. Mm. When you mentioned that time of growing up, we're talking about, I suppose, 40s and 50s, but it, but it was a time, uh, it was a pretty, in, its, in a sense, a, a dark period in, 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 in Irish life, a very conservative time and, and very uh, much uh, religious life and religious practice was very much to the fore. And I presume you, no more than, uh, than the rest of us, you know, were, would have been influenced by your religious training at that time anyway. I was enormously influenced by it, but unlike many of my colleagues, I never resented it, even in retrospect, I must say. Uh, 
I used to fast uh, at Lent. And I remember as a child my little box of sweets that I had uh, collected during Lent. And the kind of theological discussion that used to go on whether Lent ended at 12 o'clock on Easter Saturday night or whether one should wait till after High Mass on the Sunday. That kind of way of negotiating what was happening was vividly uh, instilled in me. And that sense of sacrifice helps me even to this day. Very late at night I've got to write a report or something. I can marshal that sort of self-will as it were so I never resented in that sense but very early it had extraordinary formative things for me because religion in a perverse sort of way greatly expands one's horizons like what is hell what is eternity what does a god look like these were ideas that were alive and vivid in my mind at the time and I remember in the convent I went the presentation convent when one went into the infant's place there was a sort of uh, two and a half dimensional uh, statuette on the wall showing hell with flames consuming bodies. I remember talking to one of the nuns about that, Sister Fursey, and uh, she said it would go on for eternity. Now, I had no idea of what eternity is, so I said, what is eternity? So she said, a very, very long time. I said, what does a very long time mean? And I remember by that time we were walking out in the convent grounds, and she pointed to Tune Cathedral, which is just on the edge of the ground, and she said, if you imagine that that is made of the hardest metal that your father uses in his workshop and every hundred years a wagtail lands on it and just rubs it with its tail eternity will be how long it'll take to wear that church away Mm. and that sense of eternity and then when I did mathematics ideas of infinity were deeply informed by those childish insights so I never resented that uh, indeed, the reverse. I relish it in many ways. Well, your your leanings were obviously always going to be towards um, engineering and design, which is, is where you ended up, uh, with influenced by people like uh, Sean Cleary. But uh, you, know, you you went through a phase at one stage uh, in your teenage years, I think, where, where you you um, you tried flying. Or you, you, That's right. To, uh, yes, I, I remember. I used to uh, look out over the back garden uh, into the the fair green, and I was fascinated by the way in which birds could fly and seagulls could hover. In whether it was a gale or a mild wind, they could hover over the thing they were going to pick up. And I couldn't understand why they could do that, and I couldn't, because we seemed to be so much superior to the birds in many ways. We could catch them and so on. So I decided when I was about eight, I would try to fly. And I remember my basic instincts were not too bad, even in retrospect. I made a very light frame out of scallops, and I got copies of the Independent, I remember, and I glued them together to make wings. And I then found a simple way of fixing these to my arms. And on a very, very windy November afternoon, I ascended the palace, the Protestant bishop's palace wall, which seemed to me to be with the wind. There was virtually no lift or no resistance. If, however, I turned them to face it, then the force was terrific blowing me back. So I was already learning about aerodynamics. Meantime, he was at the bottom of the wall building up a huge bundle of leaves, which seemed to me a terrible act of disbelief directly under me. I mean, he assumed I wasn't even going to go yard. And sure enough, when I tried to fly, I crashed down into the leaves. But he became a head teacher at a school and I became an engineer. And I think it has to do with experimentation and uncertainty. You're suggesting that all teachers are, are innately cautious, conservative. Well, I think many realists. of them are, but I've met mm. also some very great ones like Sean yes. Cleary. Of course, you made two mistakes there. You served your right for trying to fly from the Protestant <laughs> bishop's wall, and you obviously should have used the Irish press so maybe instead of the Irish theolo- independent. theological lesson there, yes. And if you'd used the Irish press, maybe <laughs> you might have flown further. However, uh, as with many young people, I suppose the, the opportunities for further education or for employment were not great in the, where would, where would we be now, in the 50s, and so you eventually went abroad. Yes, I, I was very keen on languages, uh, and hence I'd learned German and couldn't speak it very fluently by that stage, but I also was deeply interested in engineering, and it seemed to me awful that one had to select one or the other. I mean, why should it not be that one could be interested in languages and poetry and literature and also be a good 
engineer. So the Kaplan family suggested a solution to that, which was to go to the continent and study engineering sciences through German, which indeed I did. Now, there were no agencies at the time that would arrange exchanges. It's not like today. Every school has got an exchange arrangement with some other one or every university. Nothing like that existed. So I had all the interesting and challenging and creative activities of writing to different embassies and finding out how I could go and how I got a passport and trying to find out where I could stay when I went there. And eventually I negotiated an arrangement and uh, went abroad uh, to Switzerland firstly and then Germany and it proved to be an extraordinary educational experience in the truest sense of the word, education. The, the very the very business of, of going about organising that you're saying was, was the Yes, education. because there's a danger it seems to me that systems, educational systems, social services, everything else will be so active and so supportive that they will actually render us passive. Now I don't mean that we shouldn't have supportive systems but there's a danger that we do so much for people in all kinds of ways that we deny them the right to do things for themselves and gradually they will lose the capacity to do things for themselves. So this sort of self-activism, this self-starting capacity has for me always been very important. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean that in any Thatcherous sense. And you came back uh, eventually to, to England. You spent uh, quite a, some time in, uh, with Lucas Aerospace. Yes, I worked with Lucas Aerospace um, for some 18 years. Uh, coming to London as I did then meant I was able to get into the aerospace industry in a very serious sense. It was also uh, very fortunate for me in the sense that I met my wife Shirley, to whom I've been married for 30 years, has had enormous influence in my life. Uh, I think the kind of balance that a couple can create and the context in which to bring up their children is a very, very important learning and developing process. And I learned an enormous amount from her about how one deals with these sort of things. And when uh, I'd done an enormous amount of work, as you know, in the field of design and for the disabled and all these sort of things using advanced technology. But strangely enough, um, our own son developed multiple sclerosis when he was about 18 or 19. We didn't quite realize at the time. And he was studying French and German and uh, his condition deteriorated and he now can't walk. But my wife's insights into how to deal with this were for me a revelation. Uh, she had the idea that instead of um, looking at this purely as a personal problem, which could easily destroy one's, one's life when you see your child in that state, that we'd sort of transform the problem into a project and we have set up a home for um, five or six young people in the same sort of condition. And we've set up a trust to go with that so that, in fact, uh, it means that he will have a life independence of us. He will have his dignity, his own life, so will other young people. But instead of dealing with it in a very introverted, narrow, personal, pining way, my wife had the idea of turning it into its opposite, which very much accords with my own way of doing things, but I would not have thought of that. Mm. So, I mean, that has been a great learning experience mm. for me. Mm. Now, to come back to Lucas Aerospace, you became very involved there in the whole trade union movement, which was, to, of course, to come to a head eventually when there was this uh, huge uh, redundancy problem in Lucas Aerospace in the, in the 70s, was it? Yes, this was one of the areas of voluntary work. I, I feel myself it's very important that all societies are very vibrant voluntary bodies because often there's all kinds of ways where one can express one's knowledge and creativity and ability and so on. In my own case, I concentrated on the designers' union and the manner in which at a conference you have to encapsulate a series of ideas in a three-minute speech or that you often have to deal with an unpopular type of program and explain both its positive and negative features. That was a very important learning process for me and I eventually became the national president of that union as a lay member. I feel strongly that unions and organisations of this kind should be run by those who work at the occupations and the jobs rather than professionals, that the professionals, the full-time officials, should be a resource. They should be servants of the members, not the other way round. But during the course of that at Lucas Aerospace, we were working very advanced technologies, 
Concorde and fighter aircraft and so on. And it seemed awful to us that there was all this human suffering around when technology properly applied could do so much to alleviate it. We were already working on advanced guidance systems that can guide missiles to another continent with extraordinary accuracy and the blind and the disabled were staggering around like they used to do in medieval times. So rather than accept structural unemployment, which was then being proposed in the company, our view was all that skill and talent should be used to improve the quality of life for people. And we came up with this extraordinary plan for socially useful production, about 150 products which could be made which would reduce energy consumption, would dramatically reduce pollution, and would make meaningful creative jobs for people. And it seems to me that although we lost, in the sense I was sacked in a big blow-up amid worldwide protests, that the ideas were broadly correct. And I think the ideas are as relevant today as they were then. And I think they're particularly relevant in Ireland with the massive unemployment we now see. Hmm. Just to come back to something you mentioned earlier about how you couldn't understand as a, as a young uh, engineer or engineering student how... Um, why you shouldn't also be interested in the arts and music and in uh, literature or whatever. But, I mean, in, in many ways you are you might be considered atypical there. I mean, we're back to the old problem of the two cultures, that if you are an engineer stroke scientist, well, that is your area and you might have a vague knowledge of or interest in uh, the arts, um, literature, music, and whatever. But you, you have always maintained uh, yeah, a strong bond between the two cultures and I think in other programs you have never ceased to amaze people about how how readily you can quote from a work like Finnegan's Wake and here you are <laughs> an engineer you're, you're not supposed to do things like that. Well I think my engineering and my science has always been advised by the sensitivity and imagination which artists and poets bring to topics in a strange sort of way, artists and poets often prefigure the really big issues in society and that we as engineers and scientists diminish ourselves if we're not exposed to those kind of ideas. And on one or two of your programs, I've quoted part of um, Finnegan's Wake. It's a part which advised me about the way in which to design very advanced technologically based systems to look at all the great things human beings can do and to design systems that celebrate and enhance that capability rather than looking at all the things that one can't do. And that is expressed, in, for me, most powerfully in part of Finnegan's Wake where he describes the kind of two opposites that make up each person, Shem and Sean, the positive, the negative. And he says of those who always emphasise the negative, he mm. says, and I quote, Sniffer of carrion, premature grave digger, seeker of the nest of evil in the bosom of good word, you who sleep at our vigil and fast at our feast, you with your dislocated reason, you've read your disunited kingdom on the vacuum of your own most intensely doubtful soul. Now that for me highlighted a big issue in design. Do we design systems that assume all the things that people can't do where they talk about foolproof systems, they actually mean that, that people are fools. Or do we look at all the greatness and talents and abilities of people and instead of designing systems to obliterate that, to reduce human beings to abject, pathetic machine appendages, we actually enhance the skill and ability. And I got that insight from Finnegan's Wake and it is now an area of research and design methodology which is being pursued worldwide. But of course, and as you have pointed out uh, elsewhere also, um, that's if we're talking about your education, that, that is the basis in which our education system here uh, to a large extent works, that it's, it, it is so geared to finding out what, what young people can't do or don't know rather than what they, they it can It is. Do. That is the awful thing about it. I mean, the very nature of exams, it seems to me, is what I would call a negative feedback. It works on a defect model of the world. You essentially find out what people don't know rather than what they do know. And if you give people simple questions and they each perform equally, they say they're not able to know who is good and who is bad. They can only begin to design that if they force one or other of them to begin to make mistakes. That seems to me to be a horrific way to proceed. And I sometimes point out that in some of the ancient uh, 
universities, there used to be a tradition that if you didn't like the question you got, you would simply ignore it and you would write your own question. And that, it seems to me, is what life should be about. And one thing I learned in Tune was that people might be asking the wrong question. And if they're asking the wrong question, I've just ignored it. And I've gone off and asked my own question. And I learned that quite early as a child because there were a lot of wrong questions in Tune. There was also a lot of very interesting right ones. And if we didn't have right ones, we made them up. And that's what life should be about. Mm. Just staying uh, briefly with the, the, the art side of your life, films have also um, played a, a role in your, in your education. You, you, you hark back, I think, to a particular uh, classic film at this stage, The Third Man. That's right. I saw that in Tume. It must have been in the early 50s. It had an enormous impact on me. Firstly, the whole kind of atmospheric uh, surround of the film. But it gave me insights into Graham Greene's way of thinking, the kind of complexity of characters who can be charismatic at one level, problematic at another level. And I gradually began to read his books a lot and so on. But there is one particular part in that film, which even at that moment, when I saw it for the first time, I found incredibly moving. And that is the point where they're on the Ferris wheel and he looks down at the children, now way in the distance, and he says, who would care if one of those little specks ceases to move? And that opened up a whole area of research for me, the idea that you can, that if you're distanced from something, it doesn't really matter all that much. Uh, that's one dimension of it. And gradually you get in the literature, Shakespeare's saying they appear to be only like mice upon the beach. And then in the third man, they appear to be, uh, if they stop moving, who will know the difference? In Vietnam, people talking about dropping napalm down on people. And one of them said it was like dropping a match on a carpet because you've so distanced yourself from it. The emotional connection is gone. But on the other hand, that's a big problem for our Western culture because we always talk about the idea of getting something into perspective. It's an insult to somebody to say you can't get it into perspective. And our drawings gradually began to induce the idea of perspective and the idea that you could only sort of get things properly understood at a distance. In fact, Galileo more or less says that you can only understand the Earth if you're on the moon or elsewhere. That to me has always been deeply problematic, that tension. And it was that trigger point in that film that has opened up this whole area of research on which I've written a lot and produced systems mm -hmm. which try to address it and so on. Well, finally, when you talk there about understanding the Earth and, and uh, I suppose having respect for the Earth and, and, and where humans fit in in the, in the, in the pattern of things. One of, one of the people who has uh, intrigued you and influenced you greatly in recent times is this man, Chief Seattle. Can you tell us a little bit about him and, and how, you, how you came to be influenced by him? Well, I, I was never really at ease with the kind of cowboy-type films we used to see in Tune. It seemed to me most unlikely that every member of another nation or race could be bad, which is the way the Indians were portrayed. And I gradually began to read more about Indian culture, indeed other cultures in general. And it was then I came across the work of Chief Seattle. When I say work, it's usually fragments. We said something to an American officer or president and so on, which encapsulates for me many of the feelings I myself used to have about nature in the west of Ireland. I never felt separate from nature in the West of Ireland. I always felt part of it. I felt as much part of it as the Curlew was part of it or the beautiful cloudscapes we used to have. And rain was never offensive to me. I enjoyed it, actually. You know, I enjoyed the whole surroundings and being part of it. And Chief Seattle, <clears throat> for me, brings that feeling of closeness to nature and then questions a sort of religion and outlook which separates us from us and puts us totally above it. And he confronted one of the American presidents. It was about the destruction of the buffaloes. And the American president said, well, it's true that your culture is going, but you're going to have our culture, our language, our literature, and our religion. And Chief Seattle responded in the most extraordinary fashion when he said, every part of this country is sacred to my people. Every hillside, every valley, Every plain and every grove is hallowed by the memory and experience of my tribe. Even the rocks and the sea are charged with our memories. 
the dust under your feet responds more lovingly to our footsteps than to yours, for the soil is rich with the life of my people. Our religion is the tradition of our ancestors and is written on the hearts of our people. Your religion was written on tablets of stone by the iron finger of an angry god. That seems to me to be profoundly insightful. And as we approach the 21st century, I think it should create a kind of psychological stimulus to cause us to re-examine this strange double-edged journey which has brought us where we are. It's double-edged because on the one hand we produce the beauty of Venice and the hideousness of Chernobyl. We produce the marvellous caring therapy of Röntgen's X-rays and at the same time use almost exactly that technology to destroy Hiroshima. In the German culture, which I love so much, we produce the, the musical delights of Mozart and the stench of Sachsenhausen and bergen belsen These are very, very deep issues, and it seems to me what we've got to look at is the great creative positive side of humanity and build on that rather than emphasizing and allowing the negative features to dominate the way in which we develop. And those are the things that are educating me and schooling me at the moment. Cooley was talking with John Quinn. That interview, together, together with 38 others, is in the series My Education, is now available in book form, price £12.99, published by Townhouse in association with RTE. Our next, next week's guest is Cardinal Cahill Daly, which will be joining John Quinn before that on Thursday.